Hey, Awakening family, welcome back to the study. Uh, it's our favorite time of the week, our Tuesday night Bible studies, where we get to look at topics and books of the Bible. If you're just joining us, we're going through the Gospel of John, and uh, we're in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we see Jesus doing yet another miracle, another healing. And what I find interesting about this healing is the circumstances behind it. Um, there's no formal request from the person for a healing. Uh, there's no casting out of an uh, evil spirit. There's no great drama. There's just a simple question that Jesus presents to this person who's an invalid, who's infirmed in their body. And he just says, do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? And um, it's interesting that it's just that one question, and that sets off and, and uh, offers a healing to this person. So I'm, in, I'm interested in looking at this account more uh, more fully. We'll, we'll look at it together. Uh, one thing we do is we like to read through the entire uh, section, and then we'll go back to it and unpack it verse by verse and look for details that maybe we missed in the first reading. So uh, if, you, uh, if you have your Bible and a notebook, I encourage you to open those up, uh, take out a pen. Uh, if you have any questions, throw those in the comments. I know that I'm going to be joining some of our subscribers and students from Awakening You After so that we can um, hear their comments and their questions and, and bounce some ideas off. Because even as I was reading this and, and preparing for it, I had some questions. I had some, some things that I had been wondering about. So I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what, uh, what our subscribers say about that as well. All right, let's uh, jump to it. We're in John chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 1. And uh, we'll, we'll read it together and uh, unpack it. I'm reading out of the NIV, verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Unbelievable. <laughs> Verse 11, but he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. And so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Let's pray before we unpack this. Lord, we... Um, we thank you, God, that we can gather around your word, and we pray that you would speak to us today. Reveal to us not just um, what this passage means, but what it means for us and us today. I pray especially, God, for those that have been waiting for a healing, looking for a healing. I pray today that there's new hope that's infused into them, that there's new faith that's built up. We pray, God, that healing, even as we're talking about this and, and studying it, I pray healing comes from heaven into our bodies. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, as we're looking at this, uh, th th this passage, this is uh, shortly after, if you remember uh, being with us in John chapter 4, Jesus has uh, spent time in Samaria and he spent time back in, um, in his homeland up in uh, Galilee. But now it looks like he's gone back to Jerusalem and it says, for a feast of the Jews. We don't know which feast. There are several feasts out there. There were at least three feasts that um, 
uh, all Jewish males would be required of. That just seems to be a, um, a detail that's, that's omitted, you know, which, which feast it happens to be. So it's kind of a, a side issue, not, not central to the, uh, to the topic at hand. And of course, um, it says that this was a feast of the Jews. Uh, so the, the, Jesus was a good Jew. And we see that Jesus was uh, like a good Jewish uh, man uh, going to Jerusalem, participating in these religious festivals, and, um, and visiting uh, Jerusalem along with many other people. Verse two, it says, now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Jerusalem, the Jerusalem would have the temple, but it would also have, here's a, a, um, a graphic that I was able to pull, pull from the internet. So uh, here's the Temple Mount. This is where a lot of the sacrifices would take place and a lot of the uh, feasts would take place. Um, but this is the pool of Bethesda. Uh, these are the colonnades. It said there were five of them. So that would be one, two, three, four, and five. These colonnades are these like porches or walkways that are covered and have these pillars around them. And there were at least two pools. Now this is what it looked like in the time of Jesus. And there was a sheep gate somewhere around, uh, around Bethesda. There was this sheep gate. We're not sure exactly what happened there, but my guess is, and a lot of the commentaries expect that this is where some of the sheep may have been sold for people who wanted to uh, present them as a sacrifice. So um, this might have been an area where, where, uh, where sheep were collected, uh, bought and sold, and then brought up to the, to the temple. Um, this is what Bethesda looked like back then. At least this is what we think it looked like. We don't have any surviving pictures. If you wanted to know what it looks like today, um, this is actually what it looks like. Our team from Awakening Church went there a couple years ago when we were filming for the Easter production. They went to the pool of Bethesda. And it doesn't look like much of a pool. It's because 2,000 years has gone by since it was the pool of Bethesda. Uh, shortly after the uh, the the, the times that the gospel was uh, was written, this place became heavily traveled and a lot of pilgrims went there. So a church was built around it, St. Anne's. So the pool is now a part of uh, the, the St. Anne's um, uh, church and, and monastery. But the um, it's, it's kind of been destroyed over the years. There's a lot of ruin and rubble because uh, when uh, the Muslims entered into to Jerusalem, they destroyed a lot of this and uh, built their own mosques and it's been fought over for many years. So in the 1800s, they started unpacking the pool of Bethesda. They unearthed it, uh, did some extensive digging and it's then that they found two pools that are side by side and they found the colonnades that were kind of surrounding it. And they, they believe that this is the very site where Jesus healed this man. Uh, of course, you kind of have to go back uh, use your imagination and, and imagine a lot of the ruin and walls that are currently in, in place that they weren't there. But just to give you a picture of where we're at, it's just amazing how you can go to the Holy Land today and see so many of these sites, so many of these places. Definitely something that's on my bucket list is to get to the Holy Land. Um, so uh, that's Bethesda, um, which is surrounded by the five covered colonnades. Uh, and here, a great number of disabled people uh, used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. So these really were, you know, there was no hospital back then. Many times your family wasn't able to take care of you and you would, um, you would be surviving off of the sympathy and the generosity of other, other people. So in verse five, it says, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And uh, you just are uh, 38 years being stuck in that uh, kind of handicapped position at the mercy of other people, um, just a, a long period of time. I underline this, this word here, one who is there, because it's interesting that, to me, it's interesting that there were many other people who were in a desperate situation like this man, but there was only going to be one person who would be healed. And that's, um, that's sort of a question that I have in my mind, and maybe it's something you guys want to comment on as well. But why is it, what set this uh, person apart, right? Verse six, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Jesus asks what seems to be a very obvious question. Of 
you would, you and I would think, of course he wants to get well. Why is Jesus asking this rhetorical question? But um, in my life, there have been times I've worked with people that maybe, maybe it's not a physical disability, but it's, it's like a, a, it's maybe a behavior or a pattern in their life that's unhealthy. And I try to help them out of it, but they really show no interest in changing. And I, I can't imagine that it's possible that there would be a person that wouldn't want to be healed because maybe they were used to relying on the sympathy and the generosity of other people. Maybe they don't have to work. I don't think that's necessarily, obviously, the case of many people today. But uh, you wonder, you know, if there was a reason why this person wouldn't want to be healed. Maybe he lost all hope. I don't see him losing all hope, though, because he's still in this place. He's still at this colonnade, uh, at this pool, expecting or waiting for a miracle. He really, to me, shows great desperation and persistence. 38 years, and he's still praying. I mean, how, how long have you put a request before God, and you're still praying the same prayer, the same request, 38 years later? To me, I see a man who really does have some, uh, some persistence. It says in verse 7, uh, the man responds, Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. The, um, the, 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 the picture seems pretty obvious. Um, some of the older Bibles, the early Bibles, have this commentary inserted in where they explain what may have been happening here. Uh, some of the old Bibles, some of you may, may even be familiar with it because your Bible says it, but um, there is this belief that an angel would come down from heaven and then stir the waters. And when the waters were stirred, that would be the time of healing. But there was a catch to it. It was only the first person in would receive the healing. But of course, it's a pool that's surrounded by many people. And here's the catch. They're blind, they're, they're handicapped, they're invalid. They can't get up and walk and jump into the pool. So how are they going to get down there? And that seems to be his, his, uh, his gripe, his complaint. It's not, again, I, I don't think he's hopeless. I think he's helpless. I don't think he's lost all hope. I just see a man who has no one to help him. Part of me wonders if Jesus' question, do you want to get well, <clears throat> is a is a, uh, an effort of, by Jesus to help this man see his own uh, desperation, to see just how truly helpless he is. Um, for him to, to have to say, I can't even get into the, to the pool by myself. I, I'm not strong enough to do it. And I don't even have people or a family or friend or anyone that's willing to help me to jump in. Jesus's question may have been an effort to highlight how stuck we are, how helpless we can be in our own state. And what I see here is almost an illustration by Jesus, almost a parable, a living, breathing parable, a true life parable of our, our state uh, in relation to God, that we need God to be our savior. We are helpless when it comes to you know, achieving salvation. Uh, yesterday in crew, we were talking about salvation and God's forgiveness. And some of us, some of our crew members were, were wrestling with that idea. Like, I, I don't feel like I, for, I deserve God's forgiveness. And, and that's true. We don't. We don't deserve his forgiveness. And we don't even deserve, in this case, I don't think we even deserve the healing. Like, we, we, we haven't earned it. This man hasn't done anything. And in truth, he can't. And I think that's, that's the larger point that I think is at the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the core of this, um, this account. In verse eight, it says, then Jesus said to him, um, or actually I've skipped this part, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So again, it's like, it's a free for all, it's um, it, it, survival of the fittest, whoever is closest to this thing is going to, to get, their, get their healing. Um, verse eight, then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. In Jesus' statement, I see a couple of things. First, I just see the clear authority that he has. The man doesn't even know who Jesus is at this point, right? He says, sir, but he doesn't recognize him as the Messiah, as the Lord. But instead, uh, Jesus just asserts his authority into the situation, commands him to, to get up. 
uh, pick up your mat and walk. Jesus, without laying any hands on him, without any prayer, without casting off any evil spirit, um, with, without getting any, any deeper dialogue other than do you want to get well, Jesus immediately and graciously heals this man. And he does it so confidently. He just says, pick up your mat and walk. There's no, you know, check it, let's test it out, let's see how, no, Jesus just knows. He has full authority over physical matter. He has full authority over life and death. And he just speaks to this man's body, speaks to this man and says, get up, pick up your mat and walk. Um, great confidence, great authority. And, um, and, and, and you can just see that uh, Jesus knows how, how this is gonna end. At once, the man was cured, at once. Uh, there are times that um, we see a healing be instant. And this is one of those instant, one of these cases. In one moment, which is one word from Jesus, he's healed. And I've seen it in my own life, in, in, in a ministry and in church. Uh, there are moments when we're praying, we're believing, praying for a person, and literally it's in a moment. In, as soon as you say amen or in the middle of the prayer, they're already healed, jumping up and down or feeling better, whatever the ailment might is. But then there are times that I see healings being progressive, where it might take a second prayer, it might take perseverance, it might take persistence. Uh, even with Jesus, there was a time when Jesus prayed for someone, anointed for someone, but it didn't catch the first time, Jesus prays again, and then the healing uh, comes over, over the person. So in this case, this man, in a moment, instantly, at once, the man was cured from whatever this ailment was. And uh, what, what is uh, surprising to me is just how, I, we've talked about how in John, John seems to be making a case for who Jesus is, that he is uh, not just another man, he is, there's a supernatural nature to who he is, that he's God, the son of God, that um, that he's a miracle worker. And we see how Jesus is able to do in an instant what this man wasn't able to do with 38 years. While other people were waiting and persevering and, and, and all, Jesus is able to do instantaneously. But at once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and walked just as Jesus told him to do. So he, he obeyed, he, he uh, responded appropriately. Uh, the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. Um, that shouldn't even be an issue, but we see that the Sabbath becomes an issue later on in this, um, uh, as, as we continue to read. In verse 10, it says, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. Uh, to be clear, when, when it says, so the Jews, this isn't a, uh, a disparaging remark against all Jewish people. Uh, here, John, uh, John the writer of this gospel, is Jewish, so he's not, um, you know, anti-Semitic. When he talks about um, the Jews, he's talking about the religious leaders. He's talking about the Pharisees, these people who prize themselves not just on the knowledge of the law, but a meticulous application of the law. For the Jewish people, the Sabbath was a... A, a day that should be absolutely set apart, not just a day of, of rest, but a day of, of, a, of full obedience to God and to the law. And to help them with that, the Jewish people uh, over the years would add these commentaries to the Bible where they would break out, Shabbat would be uh, how the, uh, in Hebrew you would you'd talk about the Sabbath. They would talk about the 39 categories of the Shabbat. So on the Sabbath, you would not be able to do any of these things. So when you and I think about no working on the Sabbath, we're thinking we're not going to work. It was much more than just abstaining from uh, your workplace or going into your shop or, or, or place of business, but you weren't able to build things, burn things, carry things, uh, no planting on that day, no, uh, no tanning as in um, working with leather, uh, no unraveling things. Uh, very, very meticulous. Today, for Jewish people, that means all sorts of different things. Um, uh, my, my old pastor grew up in New York City in a Jewish neighborhood where he would spend time on uh, the Sabbath, on a Saturday morning, standing in elevators for, uh, for Jewish people because they would not push a button on the Sabbath because for their particular um, uh, brand of, of Judaism, the Orthodox Jews, 
it was considered work because you would be um, burning. I think it fell under the category of burning because when you push the button, a spark starts and you're completing a, a circuit, an electrical circuit. So for you and I, that's like, that's not work. How could pushing a button be considered work? Well, for some Jews it's not, but for some Jews who, uh, who wanted to strictly adhere to the, to the law, they considered that uh, burning and considered that breaking the Sabbath. So my old pastor would make money, you know, a quarter for every time he uh, would push a button and they'd, they'd go um, up and down on these elevators. Now, other elevators in a, uh, would actually stop on every floor. They'd have these Sabbath elevators, like in Israel. On Saturday or Friday night, they would just stop on every single floor. So you would just step in and just wait for your floor and then just jump out. What we see today in, the, in Jewish culture and in Jewish religion is, um, is very much what the Pharisees were practicing back then. Um, when he says, uh, it, or when they remind him, it is the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. That was one of the rules uh, right here. There was not to be, oops, there was not to be any carrying of, of a mat. So for you and I, I mean, picking up a mat, that shouldn't be a big deal. What, what strikes me is how they, um, they're missing the, um, the larger picture that this man was, was healed. He tries to tell them that, right? In verse 11, he says, but he replied, the man who made me well, who healed me, said to me, pick up your mat and walk. In other words, this man commanded me to do it. He healed me. Uh, God is clearly over him. He clearly has the power and authority of God. I obeyed him. I'm not going to disobey the man who tells me to pick up my mat and walk after he heals me. Yet the, um, uh, the these Jewish leaders uh, objected to, um, uh, to, to the man doing that, uh, disobeying the law. But I think what incensed them even more was how they believed that Jesus encouraged this man to break the Sabbath. Um, it was one thing to break the Sabbath, but what's worse is being the person who's egging them on, who's encouraging them to do it. Uh, so in verse 12, so they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up and walk? They want names. They want to identify him. They want to make sure that he's taken care of. Um, in verse 13, the man who was healed had no idea who it was. See? For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. So uh, what's, verse 13 is important to me because sometimes we, believe, we get, get it stuck in our head that in order for God to heal us or in order for God to perform a miracle in our life, we first have to uh, do something for God. But that's not how God works. God's always the initiator. God's the one that shows grace to us. God's the one that performs a miracle or a healing. As in this case, again, you remember, the only encounter this man had with Jesus was Jesus asking him a question, do you want to get well? Jesus didn't ask him, do you believe in me? Do you accept me as the son of God? Do you believe that I'm the Messiah? Jesus just asks him that question, do you want to get well? And it's a reminder to me of how Jesus finds us in oftentimes in a broken state, um, in bondage or stuck in sin, stuck in our own ignorance, our own pride. But then as he starts to work on us, he reveals who, we, who he is and he starts to reveal to us how to live a godly life. You know, we, we, we like to say, when it comes to Jesus, you come as you are, but as you come to him, he never leaves you the same. He starts to refine you and give you a new life and a new identity. And I think we're gonna see that with this man too. It says in verse 13 again, the man who was healed, had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Uh, shows you Jesus is uh, like his meekness. He just realizes like, this isn't about me right now. The attention wasn't supposed to be on him and his ministry, not yet. That's gonna come later uh, at the cross and at the crucifixion. And uh, Jesus never lost sight of that. Verse 14, later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Seemed like some tough words, but remember what I just said. I said, God finds us in one state, and he says, come to me as you are, 
but he never, ever leaves us that way. As you grow in a knowledge of who Jesus is and as you mature in your relationship with that, as that relationship gets stronger and stronger, um, God just starts to, 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 to put his finger on things in your life. And he starts to speak to you and reveal things to you and say, yeah, that's not good for you. That's not healthy for you. Here, uh, it's this cryptic thing. We don't really have any context. We don't know what Jesus is referring to, but Jesus says, hey, look, you're well again. Meaning, there was a time that he was well, and then a time he wasn't. And it seems as though Jesus is saying it was some sin that may have caused this infirmity to come on him. Can't be uh, certain about that, but it seems that way the base, uh, based on the way I'm reading it. See, you are well again, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Um, we don't even know what the sin is. And um, Jesus doesn't even give us the man's name. Uh, we just have this, this man who is sick. Uh, and, and, but Jesus does want to, um, he does want this man, now that he's been healed, now that he's really received a miracle in his life, he wants this man now to move forward in righteousness, move in holiness. Last week when we were talking about um, uh, miracles, uh, another miracle that took place in, um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, while Jesus was in uh, Samaria, um, I reminded you that God never wastes a miracle. And that's what I see here. I see God doing a miracle in this man's life, just a full act of grace. He doesn't demand or expect anything from the man. He just asks him, do you want to get well? And Jesus does a miracle, something only he could do. He heals him, but he never, he, he doesn't leave him there. He, he wants him to continue to grow and he says, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. What's the worst? I don't know. I leave it in the comments. We'll talk about it later uh, with Awakening You uh, subscribers and, and students. What's the worst that may happen? Is he hinting that he could die? Or is it even uh, just a hint that if you allow this sin to persist in your life and you continue to walk in it and stay in it, you're going to suffer in eternity. We don't know. We don't know. But I think the man knew exactly what Jesus was saying. It says the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. I do believe that this man's encounter with Jesus changed him forever, not just in his body, but I do believe that he stopped sinning. And he went on now to tell these Jewish leaders, these, these uh, um, uh, very, uh, very prominent religious leaders in, in Jerusalem, who Jesus is. And, um, and that is going to continue to put Jesus uh, on the map with these Pharisees. You're going to see them playing a larger and larger role in this gospel as Jesus continues to minister and ruffle their feathers. Because what he just did with the uh, w by healing this man and commanding him to pick up his uh, his mat on the Sabbath, that was in direct violation of their teachings. Not necessarily the teachings in the Bible. Uh, Jesus clarifies and would talk about how the Sabbath was not made. Um, excuse me, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. In other words, the Sabbath was not supposed to be some burdensome yoke that you had to tediously follow and obey in order to make sure that you were obeying God and pleasing God. No, the Sabbath was supposed to be a day of rest. It was instituted right after the Jewish people had been freed from bondage in Egypt. After hundreds of years of slavery, God sets them free and now grants them a Sabbath and says, remember that day, keep it holy, set it apart, rest. And if you have servants and you have people that work for you, make sure you give them a Sabbath as well. So the Sabbath was designed to be for four people. I don't think this man picking up his mat and walking away from this, um, th this, uh, this pool of Bethesda was sinful at all. Clearly not. I mean, Jesus told him to do it. So um, it, it, this was a... a, a a, a fun study. One thing that I realized as I was wrapping this, as it, we'll, we'll wrap it up now, but one thing that I realized as I was um, wrapping up this, this study or studying it, uh, preparing for today's study, is how many times when you're reading through a book of the Bible, you'll start to see patterns or ideas emerge over and over again. I've already shared some of them with you. But as I was preparing again today, I saw this other um, theme 
And there's this idea, something with the water. It seems kind of out there, but I just have just noticed now that we're in chapter five, in every chapter we've read, and in over and over again, in almost every account, every narrative of this, uh, this, this gospel, we see water playing some role. We see John the Baptist and Jesus, their ministries being compared, and how John baptized with water, but Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. We see Jesus' first miracle, if you remember, it's Jesus turning water into wine. That's that, that water that was taken from those ceremonial jars, the Old Testament, Jesus presents this new wine, uh, the better wine. We see in John uh, chapter three, Jesus having that conversation with Nicodemus. And he tells Nicodemus, if you want to be born again, you need to be born of the water and born of the spirit. Um, and then, of course, in John chapter four, Jesus has that encounter with the Samaritan woman at the pool of, uh, excuse me, at, the, um, uh, at Jacob's well. And it's at Jacob's well that Jesus tells this Samaritan woman that you can drink from this, but you'll be thirsty again. You can drink from me and I will, um, I'll make sure you never thirst again. From you will spring forth water that, that, that gives eternal life. So I'm seeing this theme and it just seems to be getting louder and louder. And then in chapter five, finally, my, my eyes have opened up to it. I'm like saying, oh, I, I can see what God is doing or what, what he's trying to present to us. And we see this man who's been waiting at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years, waiting at this pool, waiting for the waters to be stirred, waiting for someone to help him get into the water. And none of that could provide the, the, the healing and the life that he needed. But then he meets Jesus Christ, who John has already talked about many times as the one who brings living water, who brings eternal life. And that one encounter with Jesus brings this man um, full health, full restoration in his, in his body. So uh, that's just one of, the, one of the things that happens, you know, as you're studying the scriptures, studying the Bible. Sometimes you've read a book dozens of times. In the book of John, I've, read, I, I've lost count of how many times I've read it. But to see this for the first time, um, just so, 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 so cool. So I'm so glad you could join us for uh, the study this week. I would encourage you to jump onto awakeningyou.org. Um, if you haven't already, there's tons of content, tons of courses and classes to help you to grow as a disciple. Um, and then you can jump in and join me for these um, uh, live Q&A sessions that we hold every Tuesday. But um, you can go to awakeningyou.org to learn more about that. Otherwise, God bless you guys. Hope you have a great rest of the week. We'll see you Sunday and hope to see you in the next study next Tuesday. Bless you. Bye.